Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Gallagher. I'm the president of Senior Concerns, and I want to thank you for joining us today for the Path to Positive Aging seminar series, and in particular, this seminar, Planning in a Time of COVID. We have two speakers today that will be talking, and then all of you are most welcome to ask questions within the chat section. So down below, you'll see a little box that says chat. You can type in the questions you have, and then after both speakers have presented, I will go ahead and ask them your questions. I also want to take a moment to let you know that we do do these series once a month, um, sometimes twice a month. And at the end of this, I will be talking about our next upcoming uh, session. I do want to let you know also that we are recording this. And in about a week, we will have it on Senior Concerns website. That's seniorconcerns.org. And if you go to the seminar tab, then you can look for this session that was on July 9th, and you'll see the recording right there, okay? So no need to take notes, there'll be, there'll be a recording for you. I would like to introduce, uh, well, first of all, let me tell you how this seminar came to be. Uh, we recently did a seminar with Dr. Carla Reyes, who's the head of emergency medicine at Los Robles Hospital. And during that session, which by the way is also recorded and is on that same seminar page, if you'd like to see that, it was very, very good. And he answered a ton of questions. And if you're looking for an emergency room physician who's boots on the ground, who sees all the COVID cases that are coming in and has a deep knowledge of what's happening in our community, you're gonna to listen to somebody who's, who's very experienced on that webinar, on that session. And as I mentioned, that was recorded. One of the things that we realized after that session is, well, gosh, there's a lot of things we probably could do to get ourselves prepared should in case we ever catch COVID. And so with that, we determined that it might be great to understand um, really on two fronts. One, the first front is um, how do, what type of healthcare decisions might I have to make if indeed I were diagnosed with COVID went into the hospital and had to have some treatments? And how would I go about making those decisions? How would I go about communicating those decisions? And what things should I think about? And who should I have speak for me if I can't speak for myself? And then the second section of that is, well, how do I get myself prepared? How do I make sure I have my ducks in a row? I was just talking to my mom this morning. She lives in New Hampshire. And one of the things that uh, she said to me is, is her fellow, uh, what would I call her? It's her granddaughter's other in-law called her and said, I have no trust, I have no will, I have no advanced care planning. The woman's 80 plus years old. And she asked my mother, what should I do? So I think it's great that she reached out to my mom and certainly my mom gave her some resources within the community in New Hampshire, but we all don't want to be in that situation. We want to be well prepared. So that's what this seminar is about today. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker, um, bear with me for one sec, is Terry Helton. And Terry just waved so everybody knows who you are and you can take yourself off, off mute now if you want also. Terry is a nurse, um, she has her master's science nursing education, and she's currently the chair of the Ventura County Coalition for Compassionate Care, of which I'm proud to also sit on that steering committee uh, under Terry's leadership. And what we do is promote education about end of life planning. So, uh, so many of us don't understand all the details around that. And, and this, uh, this group is intended to ensure that we have public education about that both for healthcare practitioners, as well as individuals like ourselves in the community. Her experience in nursing having, has created her passion for educating the public on the importance of having conversations with their loved ones about their feelings and their choices and the multifaceted issues of life, the body, and dying. So Terry will be talking to us in a moment. I would also like to introduce Terry Hilliard Olson and Terry is on the board of Senior Concerns and also runs our Legal Concerns uh, pro bono service that we have here at Senior Concerns. 
Terry is the principal at Hilliard Law Group, which is located in Westlake Village. And her practice centers on trust and estate planning, asset preservation, special needs trusts, and family protection planning for seniors. She is also a private mediator focused on helping families, elders, individuals, and businesses resolve disputes. She earned her law degree from Loyola Law School in 1989. She's a certified Alzheimer's disease and dementia care practitioner and trainer with the National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners. And she was chosen as, uh, as San Fernando Valley Business Journal's Attorney of the Year, Trusted Advisor in 2017, and in 2018, she was chosen by Pacific Coast Business Times as the who's who as a leading attorney in Tri-Counties in 2019. Uh, before we begin the seminar, I just would also like to introduce two other senior concerns folks that are on the call today. First of all, we have Carrie Salas. Carrie is our care manager, helping family caregivers uh, deal with situations and questions and issues. She runs a couple of support groups for us, and she's available to talk uh, via phone or Zoom. Uh, with any uh, family caregiver who might be having a challenging time. So Carrie, just wave so we all know who you are. There we go. And then I'd also like to introduce Martha Shapiro. She is our Director of Programs at Senior Concerns, and she has been leading not only our Adult Day Program, which is currently on pause, but in addition to that, our um, Caregiver Support Center and our Senior Advocates. So again, thank you, Martha, for being on the call today. And now I'd like to get started. So um, with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Terry. Everybody should be on mute, as I mentioned, if you could. And then number two, if you have something that you'd like a question for later on, please put it in the chat section. Terry, I'll lead it off to you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for letting me do this today and be with everybody this afternoon. This is a very important topic and something close to my heart. So I want to introduce the idea of a person, myself even, having a history of allergies and sinus headaches. And I live with those recently, I've been having them. And I'm kind of a self-sufficient 60 plus year old and have uh, children and a family. And I don't wanna talk about things that are negative, that in my mind are negative, like planning for the future, the possibility of my dying, I just don't want to do that. I want to be with my family and have fun. So recently in this whole COVID coronavirus time, I've been having allergies. After all, it's been spring and into summer and I've been having sniffling nose, some sinus headaches, and it's been doing pretty good. In fact, one of the things I've been doing is making sure that I can smell and taste. That's one of the symptoms of the coronavirus. So I'm feeling pretty self-assured I'm okay. But I'm noticing that Benadryl and my headache medicine isn't helping me. In about a week, I'm feeling pretty rotten and I'm starting to have some aches and pains. And now all of a sudden, I'm really having trouble breathing. And my family is insisting I go to the doctor and the doctor says, I don't wanna see you here. You have to go to the emergency room. And before I can even get to the emergency room, I'm having the EMS, the emergency people showing up at my door and carting me off to the hospital. And what happens? I am so short of breath that I can't even talk for myself. And now what's gonna happen? So this is a real scenario that can happen. I, my daughter-in-law had a friend, and I'm gonna tell you the truth. She had a friend who traveled at the, in March he was in traveling for business and he came home and he tried to see the physician and they put him off because he was under 40 years old. And a week later he was dead and they tested and he had had the coronavirus. So this, this is the scenario that really can happen and makes planning important. So my stubbornness made it impossible for people to really speak up for me, especially a daughter from Michigan and a son that lived out of the area. So what would happen is default, everything would be done. Now I have a choice because I really don't have the coronavirus right now. I really do have allergies, but I really don't have the coronavirus. And I want to plan ahead of time that I could have somebody who speaks for me. And we do that by using a form called the Advanced Healthcare Directive. 
and a advanced healthcare directive is not a particular piece of paper, not a particular legal document. There are different types that we can get from the state of California, the hospital association. I could handwrite one that's called a holograph form and uh, Terry Hilliard could tell you about that. So there are different ways to do this. But the two important things that we need to understand in about an advanced healthcare directive is it's going to allow me to put in a document legally who can make decisions for me if I am truly incapacitated like I would be in a hospital with coronavirus in an ICU with possibly a ventilator breathing for me. So that's one of the things that would be important. The other thing that would be important in an advanced healthcare directive is what do I want done and what do I not want done? People always tend to think this is about saying, I don't want anything done, but that may not be true. I may want to have everything done that's possible and that document will also say that I can do that. So those are the two important things about an advanced healthcare directive that we need to remember. The final thing is that we need to make sure that it is signed by ourselves in the presence of witnesses or a notary, or a notary and that it's dated. So they're witnessing the signature, not what I'm deciding. And then when we've done that, we photocopy it and photocopies are just as legal as the original. And that's important to remember. So I wanted to get that statement out there, but I wanna go back to what's really important here. And that's the conversation, having that conversation with somebody, the people that you want to be involved in that decision making. Um, I want to say that the person that you have the conversation with does not have to necessarily be your family. It, it is the wisest thing to do is to have the conversation with your family. But it may not be the people you want to have making decisions for you. I always say they have to be willing and they have to be able. And that able is not just mentally able or physically able or now we do it uh, via cell phone or fax, but they have to be emotionally able to make those decisions for you. And in my personal life, my sister lived in the same town as my mom in New Mexico and my father. And my sister is nine years older than me, babysat me, taught me to color, was my surrogate mother when I was little. And she called me from my mom's home 14 years ago and asked me to speak to the paramedics. And I did that because she could not tell them in her emotional way that they needed to stop doing CPR. So that is what I'm talking about emotionally able. She wanted me to make that decision because I was emotionally able. The reverse side of that is that we have to have these conversations because it's important that we're all on the same page, that our people who are making decisions for us understand our values and why we're making those decisions. That's why the conversation is important. I have given seminars where there was a woman present, people present who a mother has made that decision, wrote down the daughter's name as the agent, as the decision maker, and that decision maker followed what her mother wanted, but was in emotional distress from it because their values were not the same. And it had bothered her for a couple of years after the event. So again, that willingness and that emotional ability are important, but the conversation is the highest value of that. And making sure everybody in that circle of family, friends, are on the same page with the decisions that you are making. Besides having one agent, a decision maker, it is a good idea to have at least another one. So I give the example, my husband and I travel together. We haven't traveled together in a while, but we are hopefully gonna travel together soon. And my husband happens to be my first agent, my first decision maker. And so if we're in an accident, then, and he's not able to speak for me, who is going to be that second person that could pick up that or the third person? And so I have an alternative decision maker. In fact, I have two. So that's part of the importance of an advanced healthcare directive. How am I doing on time, Andrea? 
sorry. I, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, you're good. You've got another, you know, probably 10, eight ten minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah. So um, at this point, those are the important things I want to point out about the advanced directive. Plus, anybody 18 years old and over, such as Carrie, that young person that works for uh, Senior Concerns, and Martha, the younger person that works for Senior Concerns, they need to have an advanced health care directive. I happen to be 66 years old and I've had two advanced healthcare directives. Now, part of what I wanna bring up really quick is I didn't always have a healthcare directive. Even as a nurse working for a hospital, I didn't have one though I would ask people about it. I believed in it, I pushed it. And one day I found myself waiting in a waiting room to have a uh, shoulder surgery. And I became very, very freaked out about the idea of living in a vegetative state if something went wrong. And I called the chaplain of the hospital and said, I need an advanced directive. And he came and we filled out the advanced directive and he got the people who were also in the waiting room to be my witnesses. And that's how simple it was. Not so simple now in our coronavirus time, we can get a notary to come to safely come to a home and notarize it. So that's an advanced healthcare directive. A POLST is a physician orders for life sustaining treatment. It is traditionally a bright pink color. It doesn't have to be pink, but it's pink so that it can be easily seen by paramedics. It can be easily seen in the hospital. It can be easily seen in a nursing home. The difference is a physician orders for life sustaining treatment, a POLST is actually a physician or a medical order when it is completed direct, correctly. Now, if I'm at home and I have that event and the paramedics come and I have an advanced healthcare directive, they're gonna pick it up and take it with me to the hospital. But if my heart stopped beating and I stopped breathing, they would immediately begin CPR, even though my advanced healthcare directive, and mine does say it, that I don't want CPR. They would have to follow CPR according to the law. If I had a pulse, if I'm at end of life and I have a chronic disease and I don't want CPR, then I have a pulse and it's signed that medical order will say, I don't want to have CPR, I want to allow a natural death. Then the paramedics must follow that order and not begin CPR. So, Tell me, show me your heads that you understand that idea, that they won't do CPR. So a pulse is an actual physician order. Now a pulse is, a, is meant for people who we're not gonna be surprised if they die within a year or two. They usually have a chronic illness and chronic illnesses can be heart disease, it can be kidney disease, respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's, dementia. So a pulse would be appropriate for those people. And a POLST allows us to make some decisions that will be in order, such as, do I want to have CPR? Do I not want to have CPR? If I want to have CPR, then the, we have to make a decision to have full, all care done. That means po probably a ventilator, probably, possibly with COVID having dialysis. So those are full treatments. Can you pull up the, um, do I have the ability to share? No. No. Can you, do you have the polls handy? Yeah, no, I don't. Martha, do it's you have the that you can show? Martha will show one in a minute right there, Terry. Because I want to divide this section, so, um, but I did send it. So I would like everybody to know that I sent handouts for conversations and that will have a pulse. Uh, it won't be a pink pulse, but it'll show the pulse. It'll yeah, so Terry, of yeah, so one of the things I'll do, if it's okay with everyone, I will send you some attachments that Terry has. I was going to talk about that at the end. I apologize. Terry Helton, and I'm sure Terry Hilliard Olson has a couple too, and we'll send them all to you. I'll send them via email within the next 24 to 48 hours after this um, seminar, okay. this webinar, okay? Well, let me Okay, thank you, Andrea. So the POLST is divided into three sections. There's an A section that talks about um, 
having a CPR or allowing a natural death. The next section, uh, section B, talks about full treatment, selective treatment, and comfort-focused treatment. And then the C section talks about artificial nutrition. And then the last section, D, is the signature of the physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, plus the signature for the decision maker. So this is what it looks like. Andrea has it. And so the decision maker can be yourself, or this is the important part about the advanced directive, it can be your decision maker that you've designated in your advanced healthcare directive. So a pulse, and this is not just a checkoff sheet. This again is a conversation to be having with your family, your friends, your loved ones, and your medical providers. So when the medical provider signs it, they should be asking you about your feelings and your decisions about it. It shouldn't just be a checkoff sheet and then they sign it. Or it should not be a sheet they've signed and then you fill in. So the, I'd like to, if I have just a minute, I'd like to describe the choosing a not having CPR, a choosing allowing a natural death, and what that means for full treatment and then selective treatment, because that can be confusing for people. So if I personally, if I had emphysema, and I don't, but if I had emphysema and I wanted to have, uh, allow a natural death, not have CPR and have full treatment, that means that somebody has called the paramedics. I am being transported to the hospital. I get to the hospital and the doctor says to me, we have to put you on a ventilator but they're not gonna do CPR. They're gonna put me on a ventilator. They're gonna take me to the ICU and take care of me. I recover from that and I decide I don't like that type of experience in the hospital. And so I void out my pulse because I wanna change it. And I'm meeting with my doctor and I say, I wanna have no CPR. I wanna allow a natural death, but I want selective treatment. Now I'm getting sick again I go to the hospital, but this time they're not going to put me on a ventilator. They're going to put me in the ICU and they're going to use some breathing treatments that we've probably seen with the coronavirus, with some different oxygen, with the BiPAP that they've shown on the news recently. And that will help me breathe and I recover and I get probably some antibiotics. I do this about three times. It's been about six, uh, six months, a year and a half. And I decided I am tired of this, so I want to change my pulse again. I void it out, meet with my provider, choose uh, allow a natural death, comfort-focused treatment, think about the idea of um, what my future is going to be, make sure that everything is set, and this is where I should have been doing this in advance of all of this that Terry's going to talk about, but uh, allowing a natural death in that way. If you have more questions about this, because I'm not going to go into the nutrition area, but I, um, if you have questions about the CPR factor, the choosing the parts of full treatment versus selective treatment versus comfort focused treatment, I would be glad to talk with you further. So um, I think my time is up, right, Andrea? So Terry, I think we would- Sorry. One thing that Terry is going to be providing um, that I'm going to be sending out to all of you are some wonderful decision aids. So they are things to think about when you're making a decision um, for your pulse or for your advanced directive on CPR or tube feeding on a ventilator. So those decision aids will be sent out to you. They'll be really helpful and um, we'll, we'll do that. You okay, Terry? Um, I am. There's something I wanted to add. I mentioned the advanced directive was photocopyable and it's just as legal as a photocopy. That is true for the POLST. Once the POLST is signed, it, it, you can photocopy it and you can, uh, you should photocopy it and give it to everybody in your uh, family and those who are involved in your care. The original stays with the person. It should always stay with the person and travel with them. And it is also, a pulse can be for younger than 18 years old. If a child has cancer 
and or the child has disabilities and they want to be able to take the person to the emergency room and not be questioned about choices, then a pulse would be appropriate. We've had people with developmental disabilities who come to the ER and physicians or nurses are rude and say, well, this would be your opportunity to let them go. And the parent has been very much hurt and a pulse actually could speak to them wanting to have full treatment. So a pulse is not an absolute do not resuscitate. A pulse is really about giving you back control. Right. Oh, and we have, Terry, some of those questions were coming up and we'll address some of those at the end also. Okay, Terry Hilliard Olson, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Andrea and Terry, great job. I would love to hear more about um, uh, feeding tubes and exciting things like intubation. <laughs> but um, those are things that are that come up all the time in this particular COVID twist, I call it. So right now, um, things have changed. Our immediate um, need to have planning documents are right before us. Uh, life has changed. So in my business, um, it's really about getting your ducks in a row. How do we do that? Well, the most important documents are the advanced directive that Terry was sharing, and additionally a post if needed, depending on the circumstances. And um, your Terry's point was well taken that um, generally speaking, the law looks at a child age 14 and above that can actually say what their wishes are, is they can actually be emancipated and or have a guardian with the suggestions of the parent and discussion with the doctor through a poll saying, what do I want to have happen? So it is about communication, being in choice. And for all of us, I don't know of anybody that doesn't wanna be in the decision-making process if they can be, or to some extent, if we have um, different differences in, in abilities. Maybe there's um, early dementia or other um, memory dynamics. That doesn't mean we can't plan. It means we need to have a little assistance and we can still make those really quality decisions as to what kind of care we would like to have. So I wouldn't, the one thing that um, comes up in the law often is does this person have the capacity to make these decisions? And it's really kind of a sliding scale. And the most important documents are the advanced directive saying what my choices are and who my agent's going to be. Who can make decisions when I can't? What kind of care do I want to have? And end of life, what does that really mean to me? When do I want to say no more? Do I want organ donation? Those are all things that a healthcare directive can assist us in. Um, also, a power of attorney for financials. That is another essential document. Why? Because if we're incapacitated, no one can sign our name for us. No one can sign our tax return. No one can um, sign the hospital bill, deal with Social Security, deal with your retirement, deal with your um, paying your bills on a daily basis without that form. And it's absolutely, absolutely essential. And the traumatic time especially with COVID right now, um, we really want to make sure that our agents are able, are available, because a lot of people are back east and they can't get here. Luckily, things are done electronically and by phone, but we want to make sure that we don't inadvertently, by placing someone who's, who doesn't have the ability any longer, maybe we haven't updated our documents, we have someone that's older than we are and maybe fragile health, we want to make sure we have successors, we have our enforcers, our people that will take care of us and be our advocates when we can't do it for ourselves. If we don't have those valid documents, that requires our family to get court intervention to make those health decisions that could easily be delegated through a healthcare directive or our financial decisions through a power of attorney for finances. And it's in your concerns Luckily, we have pro bono panel that we have organized. And if you need that for your loved one or yourself, please let us know. 
We're doing Zoom calls and virtual um, meetings and safe signings for those that need to update their documents. Because we don't know, I mean, if you've had a document done before um, 2000, the year 2000, it may have expired. The new documents don't expire. Earlier documents did by code. So in the year, so I have people that did their documents in 1999 and they come running in saying, this is such a great document. Well, by its, by its terms, it expired. Fortunately or unfortunately, I think uh, physicians will want to see that document and may not go, well, it's expired. They'd rather use that and say, yes, this is my agent, et cetera, it's the spouse or otherwise. I haven't seen anybody reject them when in a pickle, but we don't want to be set back. We don't want to have someone say no. Many people come to me and go, well, you know, I'm the spouse or I'm the daughter. Of course I can make decisions. That's not true. That is not true. You could have been the spouse that poisoned your husband and that's why he's in the emergency room, right? So the bottom line is things happen. The physicians don't want the liability, nor can they really tell who should be in charge. Many times there's a, anybody know a bossy daughter? Anybody? <laughs> Thank you, I got the hands. Yes, I'm the agent and my mom should be, you know, intubated and blah, blah, blah. And the, the document isn't signed, it isn't notarized, it isn't um, witnessed properly, it isn't dated as Terry reflected. We need to have that. Really, you know, we have to be very, very careful. Now, how do we prevent someone stepping in when we, they shouldn't really? Well, we want to get our documents in place, our powers of attorney and healthcare directives. I love the idea of trusts and wills, but that's later. It's really about what do we need boots on the ground in this emergency situation? At the very least, we need a healthcare directive and power of attorney. We need to have our agents have that in hand. No secret plans anymore. That's old school. I have it somewhere in a safety deposit box. Well, that's not very helpful. How are we going to get that? So you want to have your hospitalist, your doctor, your agent that you've chosen to have those documents available. We always make sure that our clients send them to their physicians. Because in a normal estate plan, we do these documents for them. We provide them electronically. So you would send an email to your daughter or son, the agent that you, what I call the enforcer, the one you really want, and they need it in hand. You can have it on your phone. If you're with a, a physician's group, you send it directly to, to them and say, please keep this on file. If you're being admitted, not in an emergency situation, they're going to ask you for that. Um, hopefully your agent will have it handy if you're coming through through the emergency. You're not going to be handing that over necessarily. If you have a POLST, which is the physician's order, that is fabulous to use when you're not well or if you have a loved one who has some, I'll say, memory dynamics. It's really important because a physician is really determining that that person has capacity in making in decision making and getting at boots on the ground what they really want then. Very, very important. Um, there is a legal presumption that the person um, filling out and signing the healthcare directive has capacity. And it's important whether it's with an attorney or social worker or uh, a physician when they're, they're filling out these documents, that they understand the gravity of what the decisions are for one another. So capacity is always a very important thing because sometimes we do see that lovely daughter, I don't wanna pick on daughters, but um, bringing in this last minute document and, and mom is, is not able to understand what's going on and now she wants to be in control. So we need our enforcers. We need to do it early. We need to be prepared. And this is part of what I call our COVID toolbox. What is it that we need to have if we have that emergent situation? Because as Terry mentioned earlier, as well as Andrea, this is a new time. 
it doesn't, just because we're young, doesn't mean we're not gonna get it. Uh, we need to be prepared. Statistically, we will have COVID at some point in time. Hopefully we won't have any complications, but the likelihood is that we are going to need that or we have some loved one that we're in charge of. Because if you're on this call, that means that you are the responsible one. You are the enforcer in the family, right? You are the one getting the knowledge and the tools to take care of your loved one. So what's in that toolbox? Healthcare directive, power of attorney, as well as your pulse if it's relevant to you. And then we also want to make sure how are we going to communicate with our loved one if they are in the hospital or in a skilled nursing facility that's now been locked down. They're supposed to allow access as of June 26, but everybody I know is saying, I can't get in there. It's still a problem. As well as these other um, care communities and living communities, we want to make sure we're able to communicate with our loved one and say, maybe I want to change my who my enforcer is. Maybe I want to change my, my directive. We need to be able to do that. It can be changed at any time. You can amend it, you can replace it at any point in time. If you see your loved one not doing what you want, fire them. I give you permission. I will make sure you get the new form. Why? Because our decisions are important. We get to decide. So that being said on the communication, the one tip that many people are using is that sometimes our loved one can't use a phone when they're in the hospital, they can't, but maybe they can use a different form of communication. This is not someone on a ventilator, that's a different story. But let's say they're having treatment that's not COVID related necessarily, but no one can visit them or it's very limited. Many people will use the, um, Amazon Echo. So they said, call my daughter, the good one, you know? So that can be on your Amazon. That's really important. How are we, what is our plan? I don't know about you. I was a Girl Scout. I always had an emergency kit. I have a first aid kit. I have a toolbox. I got my stuff in the car. So pack a bag, right? I want my charger. I want my phone, etc. I had an incident where my husband ended up in the hospital. I was getting off a plane. I Luckily, I had all that because I was just traveling. So I had my jammies, I had my toothbrush, I had all of those things. And I actually had his documents on my phone. Thank you, I listened to myself. Yay, one time. So I was able to do all that, but that was the blessing. He's fine now, but it was a time where I needed those documents immediately. And luckily, I did follow my own instructions. So. We had them, we were able to act for him, and he was not able to make decisions for a week. Scary. What do we do? Emergent, stroke, recovery after a year, thank God. But it gave me perspective on what I need and what my clients need. So getting our ducks in a row, making sure we have these hard conversations. No, I don't want Julie to be my person. And many people, that's what we spend most of our time on in planning is who not to choose, who to prohibit being in that room. It's really essential. It's who you pick, but also who you don't want there and for what reasons. So on the COVID issues, I wanna just remind people that you are the advocate for your loved ones or you're selecting an advocate. Think of them as an enforcer who will actually be willing and able, I think Terry's point was well taken, who emotionally can make the decisions. It doesn't have to be biologic. It doesn't have to be someone related to you. I picked my best girlfriend. Why? Not because she's gonna put me down quickly, but she's not gonna, she's gonna ask good questions. She's gonna know what to ask. She's gonna be me. Tell me more about that. Hmm. Not, a ha not happening, I want a second opinion. I want a third opinion. Or just, she doesn't want anything more, let her go. I think that's essential. My girls are in their 20s. That's a lovely thing. You know, they're mature, but they're not mature enough to let their mother go. The blessing is that they don't want me to go. So I, I did something right. But I didn't get put them in that position. Just because they're 
an adult doesn't mean they're they're capable or should be placed in that position. It's very traumatic. Um, so know who your community is. You are your advocate. Please look at who they are and no one, if I am in a coma, no one's gonna be yelling at me saying, I can't believe you picked Sally. I really don't care. I want the right person in line. Don't be afraid to insult somebody <laughs> by putting the right person because they, you, they'll be there. They don't really want the decision if they're not capable. So pick somebody that's really gonna be your advocate. Visitation, please know that it is essential to be an advocate because you can go visit. As of June 26th, a new campaign, Visitation Saves Lives. So if you look at Visitation Saves Lives, please look at it. Canner, which is the um, California, let's see, Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, C-A-N-H-R.org. Best place to look, great advocates. They protect our loved ones from over, what do you call it, over medicating, et cetera, but they have really good um, advocacy for all of us. We need to make sure that we can be seen, that we're not isolated, and that it is absolutely essential. If, if there's COVID in the facility, I get it, but if not, I want visitation. It's absolutely imperative. Step in for your, your loved ones. Um, so access, planning, and if anybody wants any information on assisted suicide, I, I'm your girl. I can get that for you. But I think it's important to look at that. When we are ill, we are able to make decisions ahead of time. And it is important to make that plan. That's part of our planning. And know that that's available if that is your wish. So that is the end of life options. And again, many people will have already a, an estate plan. It is essential to update your healthcare directives and powers of attorney so that they're fluid, that they're accurate, that they have the right enforcers, and especially on powers of attorney for financials, banks will reject them if they are what we call it stale. So over five years old, they look at it and they may reject it. We don't wanna be in court. I don't wanna be there with you and your family members. We wanna avoid that. So keeping it current, check in with your estate planner, um, come by, see your concerns virtually, I will say, um, to update those, those documents because we're here for you. It's essential to be effective. And I could go on forever, but I'm sure we have some questions. Thank you, Terry. That was fantastic. Um, I'm going to underscore a little bit of what both Terry's talked about for a moment. It so happened on July 4th that my husband and I weren't at fireworks and we weren't at a barbecue. We were in front of the television. And as it turns out, we tuned into 48 Hours, the television show. And that show featured for the entire duration of the show uh, an excerpt on Carrie Kasem and Casey Kasem and the families. And I don't know how many of you know about that situation, but Reader's Digest version, Carrie Kasem was married. He had three adult children. Uh, he, his first wife he divorced, married his second wife, had one more child. And as he became older, that second wife was put in charge of his health care. And at one point, um, she had not allowed the children, the three adult children from the first marriage, to see Casey Kasem for over three months towards the end of his life. And he had a form of uh, Parkinson's that um, was causing dementia also. So that started a battle between the families. And if you listen to the 48 hours story, you will feel the pain and the anguish and the stress and the acrimony that occurred between those three children, one of which uh, the children was a, a physician's assistant. And the, the second wife was still complaining that the physician's assistant didn't know what she was doing. So um, 
Casey Kasem passed away and actually they were never able to retrieve the body and the second wife ended up burying Casey Kasem in her hometown in a foreign country. And it was a terrible situation and for, all, for everyone. Casey Kasem has become an advocate for having the conversation and for documenting that conversation. Mm -hmm. And if you go to, and I will give you this email, uh, excuse me, this website, it's V as in Victor or Ventura, and then three C, four C's, V C C C C dot org you will see a video that was produced by the Ventura County Coalition on Compassionate Care with Kerry Kasem as the featured um, interviewer of these four other families and what happened when they did, or five families, what they did or didn't do with regards to their advanced uh, care. So that is a wonderful, it's about, uh, I think, 14 minute, 13 minute video and it's well worth seeing. And you can, once you understand the backstory of Carrie Kasem, you'll understand why indeed she is such an advocate for this and agreed to do this video for um, our organization for free. So I would suggest that. Okay, I am going to ask, I have four questions that came in the queue and I'm gonna ask um, Terry Hilliard Olson if she'll answer them in part because they're they're sort of legal focused. So I know I know Terry, you know them all too, but Terry Hilliard Olson, I'm gonna ask you to reply if that's okay. Is there an age limit for an advanced directive? You should be 18, but as I mentioned before, 14 and above will be, um, most of the time will be honored because that's when someone can be emancipated. Okay. Does Pulse stay with the patient or in a doctor's office? Well, a Pulse should be, number one, it can be, a copy can be used. I hope that the copy will be retained by the physician, but also you want to keep the, the copy and or um, original with you. If you're very ill and the Pulse says, do not do anything, you want that on the refrigerator or on the front door, or right inside the front door, so that the care or the cessation of care um, will be uh, honored. What were you gonna say, Terry? I would say not on the back side of the front door because when the paramedics go walking through, they're not going to see that. So it would be better to be by the bedroom door. So Sometimes on the refrigerator or somewhere. That on the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And it should really be the pulse, the advanced directive and any list of medications uh, together so they can all be picked up at one time and they can be put in a clear envelope and many of us have stainless steel refrigerators and that would hold a magnet but you could do it with some tape to hold it up there. Absolutely. Great. Are pulse directives good in all states or is it state by state? I can do that and sure Terry has some perspective yeah. as well. They are state by state. I have had families that moved to another state and have used theirs because the doctors want to honor your wishes. It's always best when you move to a different state to update those documents, but I wouldn't get rid of them. They're not invalid, um, but throughout the United States, um, generally they would be accepted. Internationally, we don't have any treaties that will honor them, but most of the time, if you, like if you're traveling, um, I always bring a healthcare directive with me um, electronically as well as in my suitcase or my backpack so that they know who my people are, what my wishes are, and most of the time physicians generally want to follow your instructions. So bring it with you. Okay, and is Terry Hilliard Olson, is that the same also for advanced, um, advanced directives and power of attorney forms? Are they universal or are they state by state? Um, they're state by state, um, but at the same time, I do think that, you know, in, um, like if I was using my power of attorney for financials with Fidelity and they're in New York, they would honor that. So it's where you reside is where your plan, like your trust and will should be uh, based or situs of that. Um, but generally uh, they will honor them if they aren't stale and or invalid or not signed or dated, et cetera. 
And one more legal question. There's a durable and a general power of attorney. What's the difference? Well, the durable is um, generally an immediate power of attorney, so sort of statutorily based. And so that means whether you're, you're have capacity or don't have capacity, they, the person that you've designated um, generally can continue making decisions for you, even if you're, it's like, it's like someone standing next to you. Like if my, if I didn't want to sign my tax return, the durable will allow my husband to sign it for me. So we have to really think wisely. <laughs> Do we want that? And a, a power of attorney generally can be springing into action when we're incapacitated or immediate. Um, so it's really essential to look at with your attorney what is best for you, but the statutory is probably the one that you want. And statutory is general or durable? Durable. Durable. Okay, great. Um, if there are no other questions, I'd like to do a couple of things. First of all, Carrie, raise your hand again, Carrie Salas. Carrie wants me to make sure that if you're a family caregiver and you have a question, I'm going to give you her direct phone line. I want to write that down. It is 805-807-7781. 805-807-7781. Carrie's been working remotely, uh, so we want to make sure you can reach her if you need to. I also want to take a moment and tell you, so first of all, thanks to our speakers. Maybe we can give them all a, a round of applause. Thank you so much, Terry Hilton and Terry Hilliard Olson. Um, so, uh, what's the word I want to use? I'm in awe of all that you know and all of the people that you're helping. And we really appreciate your time today and ability to share with those of us that are interested and how we can plan in a time of COVID. So thank you both very, very much. Uh, I also wanted to talk to you for a second about our next seminar. It is going to be, and again, when I send you stuff, when we send you stuff, and I will over the next couple of days, I'll send you the, uh, the attachments that Terry Helton has prepared. Anything that Terry Hilliard Olson would like me to send We'll send you a flyer or an announcement about the upcoming seminar that I'm gonna talk about in a second. And I'll also send you the link. It might not be active yet, but the link to be able to see this session recorded, okay? So our next seminar is Tuesday, July 21st at 4 p.m. So it's a Tuesday, not a Thursday. Tuesday, July 21st. And the topic is caring during COVID what to do when caring for your loved one becomes too much. And just a little bit about that. We know that the challenges of caregiving have become even more heightened during COVID and the need for more, and the need for more isolation. You'll hear from a panel of experts about how to manage difficult caregiving issues at home, how to recognize when you're experiencing burnout and how to know when to consider placement or other options of care. Uh, I'm gonna give you for a second a personal example of uh, a situation where I, you just kind of never know how raw you are on the inside until little things happen. And the other day we, need, we have an employee that I needed to give a new key to or key to to the building. However, the building key that I have says do not copy but I know we've made copies of them before, so I figured some, there must be some loop pill somewhere. So anyway, I went to a hardware store, I won't mention which one, and I said, here's my key, would you mind? Of course, I have my mask on, and, and this young kid comes in, and he comes to the key center, and he's got his Starbucks coffee with him, which I thought was interesting, because I didn't know that on a sales floor of a retail establishment, you're supposed to be bringing your break beverages with you, but okay. So anyway, he comes up and I said, I need to have this key uh, copied. And he said, and he hands me it right back to me and he says, I can't copy the key. Uh, it says, do not duplicate. And I said, okay, but it's my office key. I, I run the office. And he points to a piece of paper and he's getting really agitated. And he said, look, here's the situation. It's a $10,000 fine for us. I can't copy the key. And he turns around, turns his back to me and walks away. 
And I was just flabbergasted. And I walked out of the store and I got my car and I burst into tears. I'm going to get upset now, but because I think I had so much emotion in me. There's just so much going on in the world today. Um, and I don't even have someone at home that I'm caring for other than my dog and my husband. But um, I think that there becomes those breaking point times when we just don't recognize it. And so I think this next session, if you are caring for a loved one, whether that's remotely, whether if it's hands-on care, it doesn't matter, it all counts. So really consider coming to that workshop if it makes sense. And I know Carrie, um, Carrie also wanted me to let you know that she makes the legal concerns and the financial concerns appointments uh, for senior concerns. So again, you can reach Carrie at 805-807-7781 and she can make you an appointment. It will be a um, either Zoom or phone call appointment with our legal concerns team or our financial concerns team if uh, you're in need of that. So with that, I'm going to conclude this presentation and I invite you to come to the next one and I look forward to seeing your faces. Thank you so much. And thank you again to our speakers today. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Terry. Bye-bye, everybody.